Welcome to our service. Uh, we thank those of you who continue to worship in person. Also welcome all of you who worship online. Ask that you fill out uh, the connection. We appreciate uh, seeing that you're watching our services and also any prayer requests. Uh, we continue our series on the theme, Come Lord Jesus. Last week, Come Lord Jesus and Save Us. This week, Come Lord Jesus and Comfort Us. We begin with our first hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven. I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you. Do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. 
Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. And let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to repair the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light in our path through the darkness of the world, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson for this evening is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, where the prophet Isaiah speaks a message of comfort and peace and assurance to his people. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and call out to her. Her warfare really is over. Her guilt is finally paid for. Yes, she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. In the wasteland, make a level highway for our God. Every highway, every valley will be raised up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The rugged ground will become level, and the rough places will become a plain. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh together will see it. Yes, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice was saying, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry out? All flesh, is all flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the wild flower in the countryside. Grass withers, flowers fade, where the breath of the Lord blows on them. Yes, the people are grass. Grass withers, flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Get up on a high mountain, O Zion, you herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, you herald of good news. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Look, the God, the Lord, will come with strength. And his arm is ruling for him. Look, his reward is with him. The result of his work is in front of him. Like a shepherd, he will care for his flock. With his arm, he will gather the lambs. He will lift them up on his lap. He will gently lead the nursing mothers. This is the word of God. We now continue with the singing of Psalm 85.
our second lesson is taken from 2 Timothy, 2 Peter chapter 3, reading verses 8 through 14, which describes the Lord's second coming. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. For the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow to do what he promised, as some consider slowness. Instead, he is patient for your sakes, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a roar. The elements will be dissolved as they burn with great heat. And the earth and what was done on it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be destroyed, what kind of people ought you to be, living in holiness and, and godliness, as you look forward to and hasten the coming of the day of the Lord? That day will cause the heavens to be set on fire and destroyed, and the elements to melt as they burn with great heat. But according to his promise, we look forward to new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, dear friends, as you look forward to these things, make every effort to be found in peace, spotless and blameless in his sight. This is the word of God. Alleluia, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. All mankind will see God's salvation. Alleluia. And our gospel is written in Mark chapter 1, reading verses 1 through 8, where we have described for us the work of John the Baptist. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is how it is written in the prophet Isaiah. Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who prepare the way for you. A voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way for of the Lord make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and preaching of baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist. He ate locust and wild honey. He preached, One more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear Christian friends. Listen as I read again 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. For the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow to do what he promised, as some consider slowness. Instead, he is patient for your sakes, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. This is the word of God. May be seated. Dear children of God, in the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah, we have described for us the calling of Isaiah. And in that section, it describes the Lord seated high and exalted on his throne and a train filling the entire temple. There were seraphim there with six wings. Two covered their eyes, two covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they sang this song, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah was taken aback and said, Who am I? I'm a person of unclean lips, and so are my people. And then one of the angels took some tongs, with a live coal and touched the mouth of Isaiah and said, your sins have been atoned for and your guilt paid. And then the Lord, the voice said, who shall I send and who shall go? And Isaiah in a very dramatic way said, here am I, send me, send me. And all throughout that time, the temple shook when the angels sang and the Lord God spoke. A very dramatic way to call someone to serve the Lord. We think to the Apostle Paul and the way in which he was called. Saul one day was walking on, along the road and suddenly a bright light blinded him. And a voice said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And then he followed the Lord and served him. We think to the dramatic way in which the Lord God called John the Baptist. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. All very dramatic ways in which the Lord called people to serve. And then the Bible says, the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. You and I were called by the gospel. Through our baptism at a very young age, we were called by the gospel. And not only were we called by the gospel, we were also called to serve the Lord. But we think to ourselves, it, it wasn't as dramatic as Isaiah or the Apostle Paul or John the Baptist. But our call to faith and our call to serve him is equally as important. We need to realize today the Lord God doesn't just call us to faith and then say, you do it on your own, take care of yourself. No, he gives us encouragement and support. And this evening we'll find comfort along the way. Come Lord Jesus and comfort us. Comfort us today during those times when we tend to procrastinate. And comfort us, Lord Jesus, so we too are ready on the last day. You know, when life gets complicated and when life gets very difficult, sometimes it's very hard to understand. But it's good to go back to the basics. Many years ago, a legendary football coach was having a trouble with his team. One day he came to practice and he said to his team, this is a football. 
it's important to go back to the basics. And I was thinking about the, that this past week. To those of you who have children in confirmation class, maybe you hear some of their review and some of what they're studying, but it's been 20 or 30 years since you went through that yourself. For those of you who don't have children or grandchildren in confirmation age, it might have been 30 or 40 years since you have studied some of this very important doctrine of God. One of the things we often study in confirmation class is the qualities and characteristics of God. We refer to the three omnis. Omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. And all those things today give us great comfort. God is omniscient. He knows exactly what we're thinking. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. And God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. But you know, sometimes those very same doctrines and very same qualities of God might scare you. God is omniscient. Even if nobody else knows what you're thinking, God does. And sometimes those thoughts aren't so good. And even if you think, I'm all by myself and nobody knows what I'm doing, God is still there. Sometimes those words are a great comfort. They might scare us a little bit as well. We also know through the Bible that God is love and God is patient. And that's the quality stressed in these verses, the patience of God. Somebody once said that if you spend 10,000 hours working on something, you can consider yourself an expert. Through repetition again and again and again, after 10,000 hours, you could consider yourself an expert. Now, you're trying to think of things that you might have done in the course of your life for 10,000 hours. But you know, there's something that we all have done. And we do it again and again and again and again. And it's the same thing again and again and again. And that's sin. We show our temper, we have fits of rage and outbursts of anger. We do these things again and again and again. But you know today, if there was ever anyone who knew what it felt like to be the object of outrage and people venting and people being upset, it was Jesus himself. And that is why when he was on the cross, he could cry out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And it was on that very cross that Jesus died for their sins. And God is patient. But the Bible also tells us in these verses, we can abuse God's patience. And then we're told, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Every single promise of God he has fulfilled. And if he has promised that he is going to do this, we dare not abuse the Lord's patience. But you might ask, why is God so patient? Why is God so patient? And he tells us in these verses why he's so patient. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Think about that again. 
the Lord doesn't want one person to perish. He wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. The Lord wants repentance. Sin is not just a little sliver of wood stuck under our fingernail. Sin is a huge, huge cancerous tumor in our body that needs to be removed. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now we sometimes speak today about the fruits of faith and what those fruits of faith are. And it's the natural result, the natural response to a life led by the Holy Spirit. But there's also fruits of repentance. As the Bible itself says, you who are stealing, steal no more. The direct fruit of repentance when a person steals is to steal no more. And isn't that true for everything? If you are stealing, steal no more. If you're addicted to pornography, don't watch it anymore. If you're gossiping, gossip no more. Isn't that the message of Advent? One of repentance and one of preparing our hearts and lives for the birth of You know as well as I do that if your garage is filled from top to bottom, from front to back, if that room is filled, you have no place to put the car or anything else. It's just packed. There's no room. If our hearts are filled with all this sin and all these things and we don't repent of them, our heart has no room for the birth of Jesus. And our heart has no room to welcome that Christ child in a few weeks. You know, there are times in life when we try to speed things up and we want things to happen a little bit quicker than they're happening. We all know there's no way that we can rush time. Every day is the same, 24 hours, seven days a week, a month, the year. We can't speed things up, but Sometimes we want to speed things up. We can't wait till Christmas. We can't wait till our next vacation. We can't wait until we can see family and friends again. And we want to speed things up. But here the Bible tells us that we should hasten and speed up the coming of the Lord. Then you think, what will that day of the Lord be like? The Bible says the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And the Lord tells us on that day when the Lord comes, everything will be laid bare. And everything will be burnt and left to nothing. Look around you today. Look at everything you see today. Your house, your car, everything you own, everything that has some importance to it. The Bible says all these things will be laid bare on the last day. All these things will be burned up. So then you ask yourself, why am I hastening for the day of the Lord? Why am I trying to speed it up? What's my goal and reason for doing this? Well, it's certainly not like Lot's wife who looked back at the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Rather, we hasten and try to speed up the day of the Lord because we look ahead. 
And we look ahead at a place of freedom and a place free from sin and a pr- place where there's no sorrow or suffering. We all as Christians say, come Lord Jesus and give us that complete comfort and relief forever. And you know, the Bible tells us one way we can speed up and hasten the day of the Lord. And the gospel must be preached and then the end will come. As you and I proclaim the word of God and spread that word throughout the world, we are hastening and speeding up the day of the Lord. Sometimes today we might look at each other or look at other people and say, well, you should be doing a better job or it's your fault or replace the blame or shift the blame to somebody else. But all of us today need to say, how am I doing? Am I becoming all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some? Am I doing all I can to share the wonderful message of Christmas and the message of Good Friday and the message of Easter to everyone around me? How am I doing sharing that message with others? Then the Apostle Peter ends these verses by saying, Dear friends. And this is the second time he said, Dear friends. And the point he's trying to make is this, You're my friends. You're fellow members of the congregation in which I serve. You're not enemies or adversaries. You are my friends. And when he says that, he says, may you be found in peace, spotless, and blameless. And make every effort to do that. And you might say, well, why? Why should I make every effort to be found in peace, spotless and blameless? It's not about me. It's about what Jesus has done for me. All that is true as far as your justified life. The Lord here through the Apostle Peter is saying, make every effort to be found in peace, spotless and blameless. Is part of your sanctified life. We shouldn't say, well, I can't be perfect, so why even try? Or these people thought Jesus isn't going to come again, so what does it really matter? Or our attitude shouldn't be, well, what does it matter what I do? I'm forgiven anyway. No, the Apostle Paul tells us, shall we go on sinning? So that's, that grace may increase. No, we died to sin. Why do we want to live in it any longer? Make every effort to be found in peace, spotless and blameless in him. Comfort, joy, trust, confidence, victory, assurance, as you and I prepare for Advent during this Christmas season, I can think of no better gifts to receive. Of all the gifts I could ask for, I have received the greatest gifts of all. Comfort, joy, peace, confidence, victory, assurance. Yes, the day will come when I too will pray, Come Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, take me out of this world. Come, Lord Jesus, and end this wicked world in which I live. But while I live on this earth, I continue to pray, come, Lord Jesus, and give me comfort and assurance along the way. Amen. Please stand.
And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds the one true faith. Amen. We now join in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, a holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this point in time, the offering is given, taken. You may give your offering as you leave. We continue now with the prayer of the church. Almighty God, we give you thanks for bringing us to the end of one church year and to the beginning of another. As you have kept us in the days that have passed, so also keep us in the days to come. Almighty God, we enjoy the many and rich blessings you have showered upon our nation. Grant to those wise and faithful leaders who will help us use your bounty for good. Establish your peace among the nations and bring the of lives and souls to the and evil. Almighty God, we face illness, pain, suffering, grief, and death, but not without your grace to comfort us or your hope to encourage us. Almighty God, we trust your mercy to supply us with all things needful and beneficial. Keep, keep far from us all things harmful. We may be kept holy and blameless to the day of Christ's coming. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. And please stand for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts. May be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comfort in life and death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters in Christ, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
to our service, just uh, one reminder, as you ushered out, uh, you'll be ushered out from the back of the church to the front. Thank you and have a good evening.